Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm here with my friend, Andrew Holmes, the founder of the Chicago RIA. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to get to talk about your unique 257 method of building wealth through real estate. So that's where I want to start today. Okay, so um, 257 is exactly what it sounds for. So it's basically, we call it 257, cash flow for life right? Two stands for two years, mm -hmm. five is um, five properties, mm -hmm. and then seven is pay them off in seven years. So two years, you have to buy the properties. Mm -hmm. You do a total of five properties and get them all paid off, or at least well on the way, within seven years. And that's cash flow for life, basically. Okay, so folks are going to ask me, so how do you do that in seven years? So I'm sure there's so a particular criteria you have. Correct. So we have kind of a, I guess what I did was I wanted to write a step-by-step -step system down. Right. That way it's easy for people to understand. Because, of course, if you hear somebody say, well, two years, five properties, and get them paid off in seven, well, tomorrow I want to win a lottery ticket, <laughs> right? And clearly there is a specific set of guidelines right. you have to follow for this to happen because it's we call it rapid fire portfolio building right? Um, which is how do you do something quickly, but correctly, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have it kind of broken down into five steps. Okay. So it's step one is about uh, the right property. Step two is about, well, where do I find the money? Step th uh, three is about um, the rental ratios, as we call it, mm -hmm. right? Step four is going to be what kind of cash flow. Okay. And then step five, we're going to talk about uh, what do you do with the cash flow? right, for all of this to work. So where do we start? Okay, so we're gonna start uh, with step one and go through these one by one, so step okay, one. Okay, so step one. So realize that, you know, for all of us, if you're kind of a child of the, during the baby boom years, or if you're a child of mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, greater depression, mm -hmm. what happens is your ideas, your thoughts, who you are gets formed by that particular era, right? right? For me, I saw, um, the crash of 2008, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever you want to call it, uh, the big crash at a very personal level. Fortunately for me, I was not a part of it. By that, what I mean is, instead of being on the statistical side of people losing, I was on the statistical side by people gaining. So I had been in real estate since what I was 19 years old, mm -hmm. right? In college, I started. Uh, I got my real estate license, and I had been selling real estate. And every single thing I thought that one should not do, people were doing, right? Uh, so 97, 98, all the way to 2001, 2, 3, all the way to 8, mm -hmm. people were buying properties like somebody, it's basically like they were crack addicts, right? <laughs> Just because something uh, went up in values every six months, mm -hmm. they would buy properties, they would refinance properties, and they were paper rich mm -hmm. and basically equity poor. Equity poor. Right? And they were poor in terms of cash flows. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a domino that if one thing collapsed, everything would collapse. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. It had nothing to do with the market. Mm -hmm. If you do foolish things, right? It's right. like I've always felt this way, you know? You're kind of flying in a plane. There's something called gravity, right? In the best plane in the world, at some point, you're going to run out of fuel, mm -hmm. right? If you don't plan on it, or if you just keep flying, guess what happens? You're yeah. going to run out of fuel and yeah. you're going to come down. It's not exactly. whether you're going to come down. It's, it's It's just a matter of time. And that's exactly what happened with real estate. And so whenever I talk about 257, what I never wanted was what I saw happen to a lot of clients, to a lot of people. See, there were a certain amount of people that just didn't know what they were doing. Right. And then there were other people who just were testing their luck. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, if I can do the, if I got away with this, so now I'm going to get away with even more crazy stuff. And when it went down, rather than looking back at it and going, what did I learn from it? They said, well, you know what happened. It was the market. Yeah, it was the market. Right? They blamed it on the market. 100%. They blamed it on the market. So let's start with kind of number one, okay. step number one. So step number one is about the property, right? So my belief system is this. Small properties in B-style suburbs are the best properties, B to C. So if we have A-grade suburbs, B-grade suburbs, C-grade suburbs, and D-grade suburbs. Mm -hmm. So A is affluent suburbs, aspirational suburbs. Right. We all know what that looks like around right. the country, right. right? You have B is bread and butter, and C that have some challenges, yes. right? 
Not and big challenges. Not big challenges, but some challenges, right? Some challenges may maybe have a little bit higher crime. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, is not the closest in right. terms of location. May not have the best schools, right? So because mm -hmm. if you have all the things that are just the best, mm -hmm. guess what that's called? A right. aspirational an or an a. affluent suburb, right? So the best value for rental properties you get in B and C suburbs, right? right? In D suburbs, they're disasters, but which is too many, uh, too many things go on where you don't want to be investing. Too many right? negatives. Too many negatives, correct. So when we talk about properties, we talk about medium-sized properties, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about areas where um, you have a good mix of about 60, 70% homeowners, mm -hmm. maybe 20% tenants is the type of properties I want to buy. And specifically, money-wise, I have a specific criteria. Okay. So I'll kind of lay it out. So we obviously happen to be in Chicago, right. like Chicago and Chicago mm -hmm. suburbs. So our market is rather a large market, right? Rather, rather so large. Uh, rather, right? <laughs> so uh, for a two to three bedroom ranch, split level style house, mm -hmm. right? Built anywhere from 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago to um, maybe 30 years ago. That's kind of the stuff okay. that we buy. And for that type of property, let's say if we buy a property for 80,000, Mm -hmm. Right, and we fix it for twenty thousand. Now this is mind you a rental rehab. Okay. Right, so I'm all in into it. Purchase plus rehab a hundred. One hundred. Plus maybe ten thousand or so carrying cost. Okay. Right, so all in cost as we call it, all in cost is hundred and ten. Okay. Now if that property on a conservative appraisal, right, conservative appraisal uh, for a refinance appraises at one forty one fifty, I consider it a good property. Okay, and explain exactly what, what that criteria is. So the criteria for that is this, that you need to have equity, 25% equity minimum in the property. Now, mind you, not because you went and saw the appraiser and you smiled at them and, uh, you know, and you made friends with them and they gave you a high appraisal. Mm -hmm. That's called cheating yourself. Guys, mm -hmm. it's one thing making a fool out of somebody else. See, you're the bigger fool if you make out of the, uh, the fool or the person who you look at in the mirror. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is this. Trying to inflate values is not smart, as far as I'm concerned, right. right? In fact, you should be very conservative. So if the property on a flip would be 180, 190, I would consider that the value of the property is 160 for a rental, right? Very conservative. Very conservative. So I want to have a minimum of 25 to 30% equity, pure equity at the time I buy. Okay. So what that looks like is I bought the property for 80, I fixed it, improved value, and now I'm in it for 100, 110, and the property is worth 130, 140 minimum, okay. minimum, minimum. And that so gives you your equity. That gives you my equity. equity. So that's the first rule. Now, mind you, these rules are set up for my style of investing. Right. Number one, my style of investing is very conservative, right? Mm -hmm. Because I want wealth. What I don't want is I don't want properties for the sake of properties. Right. Right. But I want true wealth and I want to do it quickly. Right. So that's number one. Okay. Number two. What's number so two? Number two is going to be money. I don't know about in Louisville, but uh, we don't have a money tree in Chicago. We don't have a money tree in right, Louisville either. either. So what happens is the second problem that comes in, and mind you, all of this is based on all the problems I had, mm -hmm. right, in my own uh, kind of investing. So when I started investing, I was doing flips, right? The first three years, all I did was flips. Ten flips year one. Next uh, year, I tried to do, I think, 30 flips it was. Year three, I thought I was really going to go for the, you know, moon. Big and time. Yeah, uh, big time. So I did about 60 flips. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing was running on a treadmill. That's a lot so of flips. That's a lot of flips, like lot right? Of flips. And you would think that you would have hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars after you've done that many flips. Mm -hmm. My problem was this. I had money because of doing flips. Mm -hmm. But the problem was... If I took that money and I invested it in rentals and I tied up the money, then I had no money again. You didn't have any right? money to do flips. Exactly. And so it's kind of that catch-22. Yeah. Or for people who start, yeah. they don't have any money, yeah. right? Or they may have 100, 200,000 bucks and that's not enough to build a portfolio. Mm -hmm. So what we had to figure out was how and where the money comes right. from. So money comes from two sources mainly in real estate, right? Number one is going to be private lenders, mm -hmm. right? And what I found was that there's a huge source of people that are private lenders that I built my portfolio on borrowing from private lenders. Mm -hmm. And second way in that same category is I partnered with people, right? right? A lot of times I feel for new people when you get started, at least for me, I lack the confidence. Mm -hmm. I felt that, oh my God, what if something goes wrong? So I was highly conservative. 
is I didn't want to be the person who talked my friend into doing something and it, and it went up and in flames, failed, yeah. right? I would have felt like a complete, yeah. uh, it would have been miserable for me, mm -hmm. right? And so what I did was I partnered with people from the very beginning. And what I said to them was this, hey, listen, I can help us buy a property, rehab a property, refinance it, mm -hmm. I'll get you your money back, and then we both own it 50-50. They're like, what do we do then? I'm like, we just collect rent. They're like, mm -hmm. well, what do we do with the money? I'm like, we just save it. Yeah. They're like, what do you mean we just save <laughs> we it? Don't we don't spend it. We don't car. spend it, right? They're like, we don't buy a car, we don't do anything mm -hmm. with it. I'm like, no. And what happens is this kind of unique, people who are, people who love to spend, they're gonna say, that's crazy, man. Mm -hmm. It's my money, I'm gonna spend it. If they said that, guess what? I'm never investing with mm -hmm. them. See, I wanted people who said, oh my God, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. So then what do we do next? Well, we buy another one. Mm -hmm. And again. then what do we do with the money? Well, we save it save, again. Save it again. Right? See, if you talk to somebody who is a spender, they're always trying to make more money to spend. To spend. If money. you talk to somebody who's a saver, guess what happens? You help them make more money and they're like, oh my God, I want to save it. And I, and I think this is a, this is a point it's a really unique concept because people the people I know by and large do not think this way no. they, they don't think most like people it. never never you know and it's a concept we've talked about um, a million times right we all as you know I love cars right mm -hmm. I love planes I love a lot of toys and I have a lot of them mm -hmm. right uh, but you know what the key in life what I learned was this if you take care of real estate, for the first five years, real estate will take care of you for the rest of your life. And folks, you should write this down. Right? And it's a very simple concept, but if you take care of real estate, by what by that what I mean is taking care means buying the right properties with the mm -hmm. right equity, with the right cash flow. We haven't talked about the cash mm -hmm. flow, right? And you do it judiciously for a short amount of time, right? Five Another years. way of five, five years, years. Yeah. five or six years, guess what? You can buy freedom for the rest of your life. But the first five years, you can't screw up, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's nothing different. You know, we all heard it from our mothers, from, uh, you know, adults in our life at some point, that your foundation matters. Right. To be great at anything, your foundation is way more important because if your foundation is incorrect, guess what happens? Your house is going to crumble. It's, it's a house of cards, mm -hmm. right? And so the first thing was, okay, where did I get the money? So for me, it was partnering on deals. Mm -hmm. Today, I understand I didn't have to because now I know better. Right? I could have kind of gotten around it, but I, what I found was by partnering, I didn't have to have the money. Well, but it's a safe, it's a safe way for somebody Absolutely. new to partner with somebody that has money, maybe has a little bit of experience, sure. and they worry about, well, but I'm giving up 50%, but, you, but you're getting Listen, a safe 50%. You, you know, it's like, it, the funny part is this, it's, it, people are always funny. People are like, well, I'm like, imagine this, you're starving on an island, <laughs> right? You and your friend go, catch a fish. Mm. I mean, I don't know. Most sane people will say, you know something, let's share yeah, half the fish. Share the fish. Rather than saying, well, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to get anybody's help to go fishing. Mm -hmm. You fool, you're going to die. Because I want right? all the fish. I want all the fish, right? My belief has always been is this. Listen, start small mm -hmm. and then build it. You can make the cake in real estate as big as possible. Mm -hmm. There's enough that you can't even eat it all. You can't have it all. Right. Yeah. And my belief has always been this, that if I need to do five properties, somebody partner with somebody, I can do 10, you can do 10. or 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no it, today. It sounds almost funny, right, that mm -hmm. at 200 plus properties, I could have never gotten here in my wildest imagination mm -hmm. if I did not partner with people. A lot right. of times along the way, people have said, but Andrew, you know, you only own um, half of them. I'm like, I know. That's a hundred more than 99.999% yeah. population, right. right? And we have so much cash flow that it's incredible. It doesn't right? matter. It doesn't matter. So on the money side of it, there's two things, right? So the, for this strategy to work, we do uh, what we call the 257 strategy mm -hmm. as a whole, but it's the old strategy where we buy properties with equity, minimum of 25 to 30%. Okay. We're rehabbing them. We're renting them out, okay. right? And then we're refinancing what we put into the property. We don't not refinance. Not anymore. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. one penny more. We don't refinance our equity out. Yeah. We don't take our equity, go buy a car, right? Mm -hmm. We only refinance what we put into the property so that we can replenish our cash right. so we can do it over again, right? Yeah. That's kind of the strategy in terms of money. And that's a repeatable system. That's a repeatable then, system. Yeah. What you're supposed, you know, it's, it's basically rinse and repeat every time, mm -hmm. right? And every time you buy a property, what you're doing is you're buying equity. 
Right. See, it's not about the property. The property is there. We're going to pay it off quickly. But what we're buying is, guys, listen, the difference between gambling, which most people do, versus investing is that you pay $100 and you get an item or a property worth $150 or $160. Right. That's called investing, mm -hmm. right? Buying something, hoping to pay $100 and hoping it turns out to be $200, that's called a fool, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just what it is. Right? This is not, we don't hope. We don't hope for the property to go up in value. Right. If it goes up, God bless. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we buy it on. We don't buy appreciation. What we buy is we buy equity and we buy cash flow. Those are the two things mm -hmm. that we always buy. And those are really core concepts that most people, they just don't understand. They right. start out, they get a property. Lord knows I did it. Uh, you, you've got way too little cash flow and you you hope that it, you're really hoping it'll go up. You know, yeah. I had a property given to me, and I tell people the story. Was it a good deal? Heck no. It was 100% financed. And, and that's where it always amazes me that, I mean, this is something, and I'm on plain record because we show the addresses to every property we own. I have mm -hmm. nothing to hide, right? And literally, I mean, we have what, a group of 450 people in Chicago that I work with with over 6,000 houses. I mean, think about it. 6,000 right? 6, houses. The average person has bought these properties in less than four years. It's over 12 properties per person, mm -hmm. right? Because so it's not just that it's duplicatable for me. It's duplicatable for almost anybody, mm -hmm. you know, as long as you apply yourself. So that's a question I get all the time or the uh, our comment. They'll say, well, that works in your area, but that's not that's never going to work in my area. So th this is a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. This is a that besides some of the nutty places like maybe the city of New York, uh, maybe, you know, uh, New, not even Phoenix, mm -hmm. because in Phoenix, as soon as you get out of the main part, it works all day long mm -hmm. in Arizona, right? Now, you might not be able to do it downtown Phoenix, right? right? But as soon as you step out a little bit in the suburbs, mm -hmm. guess what? It works, it works, right? If you're in Miami, just kind of the right by the beach, it's not going to work. Or in California with some of the wacky things going mm -hmm. on or Seattle. Mm -hmm. But you take the extremes out, which is 99.9% .9 of this country, mm -hmm. guess what happens? There are deals, so there's, this is something I'm glad you brought up because there's three types of deals that happen in any, in any town, okay. right? Number one is obviously the MLS. And what do most investors do? Go fight over, um, you know, like in our market. Last mm -hmm. year, there were 250,000 properties sold in the MLS in oh, Chicago, wow. right? Now, guess what? That market, is 250. There were another 60,000 properties that sold in Chicago that were not a part of the MLS. They're off-market deals. They're off-market off deals. deals. 60,000. Mm -hmm. My Not question favorite. is this. How many investors were buying those properties? And not by, oh my God, my neighbor was selling, that's why, right? And I ended up, but how many people can find those? Because there's, like I said, three types. The MLS, mm -hmm. which is where you're gonna pay the highest amount. Mm -hmm. The second is gonna be all the auctions. Right now, in some areas like yours, the auctions are picked through. Right? right. I was funny when I came and spoke at Louisville. Somebody mm -hmm. told me, like, Andrew, you know, the uh, auctions are awful. I'm like, why is that? They're like, you actually have to pay money at the time of the auction. I'm like, well, I thought that's how it was supposed <laughs> to be. Right? No, no, this is kind of funny. And I'm mm -hmm. like, they're like, no, we used to get time. I'm like, come to Chicago, you'll see the competition. Mm -hmm. Right? How tough it is. Right? But that's the second layer. Mm -hmm. Now it's more for more sophisticated investors. Right. But you know, one of the easiest places. You, it requires more work, but it is one of the most profitable places to buy is off-market. Off-market. And guess what happens to most investors? Well, you know, Andrew, what my problem is, I want to become a millionaire, but I just can't find a deal. Mm -hmm. What if somebody can just give the deal to me? Then they'll say, well, what if somebody can just rehab it for me, right? And well, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, I don't have any money either. So <laughs> you're not going to find it. You're not going to rehab it because, mm -hmm. oh, that's not that's my work. deal. And then you don't have the money. Why is somebody going to give you the property? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, it always amazes me. I want to be a multimillionaire, yet I'm willing to do no work. I'm looking for the magic button. I'm looking for the magic pill, mm -hmm. right? When you find it something ethical, moral, and legal, please let me know, <laughs> right? But it doesn't exist. So that's about money, right? Mm -hmm. So f step one on money is the money for the buy and the rehab. Step two on the money is always going to be the refi, right? right? So either commercial portfolio refis or residential refis, either one. Right. Okay. With the goal being con conservation of capital. And even though you're getting your invested money out, still 25 to 30 percent equity. That's okay. the key issue. Right. On so the that's day of closing. On the day of the closing. Yeah. That's step one, step two. Okay. Right. Let's step three. 
Okay. Step so three. step three, I combined it with step four. Okay. Right? In the five. It's about the rental ratios. Okay. And it's about cash flow. Okay. Right? So, and this is kind of a little technical. So for those people that are listening may not understand it. It's okay. There's nothing to be ashamed of. We all learn somewhere. Right? So there are two ways that one should look at a property. So imagine this. You walk up to a property and the owner says, hey, listen, I collect $1,000 in rent. The first thing that should come to your mind is 70% formula that mm -hmm. I heard on Sharon's show. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? See, what that means is a simple rule of thumb we follow. If 70% of all rent collected covers all your expenses, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and management fees. Okay. Right? If it covers all the expenses, guess what? It's a good deal. It's a good deal. Yeah. Now, that you passed one criteria, right? Right. We have three different criteria. Okay. Number one, obviously, the 70% rule. Number two, does it have equity? And number three, does it meet our ratios? Okay. Right? So we'll talk about that next. So that's the 70% rule. So well, you say, well, you know, the rent in my area is 1600 No problem. Multiply that by 70%. Take 70% of 1600 If all your numbers are covered, guess what? 99.99999% of times, it's a good deal, right? Um, so that's number one. Okay. Number two is a bank, and this is something I've heard over and over, right, all the time. People are like, well, you know, I want freedom from real estate, right? My question is this, how? Right? See, to me, freedom is not buying an exotic car. To me, freedom is not living in a big house. Right? That's, in my word, called BS. Right? I don't want to mm -hmm. see the toys because you can run, rent the toys, which is called a lease. Right? <laughs> no, that's just what right. I am. And to me, wealth is not measured by how big a house you live in. Right. See, wealth to me is measured by how many houses other people live in for you. Does that make sense? Yes, and See, pay off those houses. Exactly. Some person says, well, you know, I live in a nice big house. Well, good, great, that's fantastic. But if you have to run on the treadmill to pay, to pay for that house, house, to me, that's not wealth. Mm -hmm. You're running on the treadmill. Now, some people take pride in running on the treadmill. See, I saw my parents run the treadmill all their life. Very, very successful surgeons, mm -hmm. right? And my point to them always was this. Why should we go to school? See, it's called education. What happens is the when you graduate from college, there's something called the commencement ceremony. Mm -hmm. Most people think, oh, I graduated, my education ends. And I'm done. I'm done. Right? Done. <laughs> commencement means your education begins. Mm -hmm. Right? Why is it grown adult men and women go to college, study 15, 20 years of your life? Mm -hmm. And what did they study is they study to run on a treadmill for the next 40 years of your life so that they have to watch what they spend in their retirement. Mm -hmm. To me, if there was a definition of mad... That's the definition. You know, and it's funny because we were all raised, and even when my parents had small businesses, they were still on the treadmill because it was a, there was no passive income. But they didn't know any better. No, there was See, the, they, it was a the, different the, time. It was a different time, yeah. and these ideas, these thoughts, these types of discussions were not mm -hmm. available. Right. Right? They just were not available. You, you thought all you had to do was work 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, save, 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 save hopefully have something, and then try to basically, you know, die before your money runs out. I mean, yeah. that's just, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's what it was. That was the formula. That was the formula. Mm -hmm. So if you truly want to retire with real estate, what you have to realize is it's a formula called 1.33, mm -hmm. right? What that means is your DCR, your debt coverage ratio, that's the formula a bank looks at it. See, we can't buy real estate based on my job mm -hmm. or my flips. The way to buy real estate is the way a person buys a hotel is a person buys a mall, is a person buys a shopping center, mm -hmm. right? The way somebody qualifies to buy a hotel is not based on who they are. It's based on what it will produce. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's a commercial way is how residential real estate investors have to look at it. So it's called the 1.33 formula, which is your debt coverage ratio. But no, they don't look at it that way. Now, no. commercial investors, uh, if you're buying apartment buildings... Or, they always look at they it They always way. look at it that way. So I think this is the... Something that that people buying houses they don't often know this. No, they, nobody knows nope, this. They're not nobody, taught this. See, people. Buy, the funniest thing always, always to me is like Andrew. You know, we own a lot of property. I'm like, that's fantastic, great, right? Um, what's the cash flow? They're like, oh yeah, it's great, man. It's like fifty dollars a month. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like fifty whole dollars per. Fifty dollars. They're like, oh yeah. And I, I manage got, it myself. Yeah, and I manage, manage it myself. myself. You know, and I got ten doors. <laughs> so I'm like, you got. 
a whole $500, right? I mean, like, it's just the most crazy thing I've ever heard, ever heard mm -hmm. right? And people look at me and they're like, you're out of your mind. I'm like, no, we do. That's the second part of this formula. Mm -hmm. Every do I don't own a single property, right? A single property that makes less than $450 net, right? We're not talking about gross income here. We're talking about net income. And that includes management, that includes every single thing. And here's the difference. None of them are shacks. Me and you can go live there and be proud of the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That that's a really interesting concept because I know when I when I first started out, we weren't taught that. We were taught you get a hundred, two hundred dollars a month and and one day you'll have enough properties to be able to hire a manager. And with the talk was always, How many do you need? Well, when you get five, seven, eight, ten you can hire a manager. No. This is a totally different concept. See, because the difference is this. The biggest thing is actually running an investment business is not buying, number one, crappy properties. Right. Number two, not buying leftovers of other people. Right. It's going out and finding good quality investments. Mm -hmm. Right. See, I don't care how hot the market is. There are properties in your town, and I guarantee you, I don't care who it is around the country, I challenge you. There are properties in your town being sold 60% of value, 50% of value. The question is, are you finding them? Mm -hmm. The question is not whether they sell or not. They sell all day long. Distress mm -hmm. sells all day long in the hottest, the hot market, mm -hmm. right? We see it in Chicago. People come in, oh, I can't find properties. I'm like, you want to bet money? I can find properties in any suburb. Just give me. Now, the question is not whether I got them or not. Mm -hmm. Somebody else got them, that means I missed it. You missed it, but they're there. They're there. They're there. They're there. Every single day, there are properties sold right under our nose, right? Mm -hmm. It may be somebody who buys it down the street because we see that. We don't just track the MLS sales. Mm -hmm. We track all the properties that change hands in a county. So if we take okay. a county like Cook County, it's, oh my God, it's one of the largest counties in the country. Right. If you look at the number, I mean, literally, you want to jump off a bridge. If you look at some of the sales where you buy and you're like, you know, I bought a property for 80000 it's a home run. And you'll find sales in that same neighborhood within the same month, within the same, uh, I should say, within the same uh, suburb that are 60 and 70. Okay, so you find a list provider that gives you all the sales. We downloaded, we downloaded from the Cook County system. Cook County system, yeah. okay. And every in every town it's available, mind you, right? It just depends on how many hurdles you're willing to jump through. To get right. It. So let me get to the next one. Okay. Right. So we talked about cash flow. So the minimum cash flow that I think somebody should buy a property with minimum, minimum, minimum is three fifty to four hundred minimum per property. Okay. Right. That's per property. So if you're buying a two or three flat, right? We don't count a two or three flat as, oh my God, I got four doors. The way we count it as one. That's how we it's count one it. Door. It's, one it's door. It's basically if I said if I have let's say five single families and two three flats, okay. right? So that's five single families, so that's five properties, and two fleet, three flats, we count it as one building. That's yeah, just how yeah. we, you know, that's just how we count it. So you have total of seven properties. Okay. We don't double count because if you, you know, You're used to You're just counting be, buildings rather yeah, than Yeah, the only time I lie doors. is when I basically quote how tall I am. <laughs> I'm barely 5'5", five five, I tell everybody I'm 5'7". That's the only, you know, in real estate, I don't lie because I'm lying to myself, right? Uh, but I'm being dead serious. So when it's a two flat or three flat, we count that per door within the property, you need to make a minimum of 350. Okay. Per okay. unit. So if it's a three unit, 350 times three. Okay. You know, so if you don't make that kind of money, then I don't consider it a good property. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy this, mind you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying if there's, oh, you only have 20% equity, you shouldn't buy it. But the standard you should set yourself is high standards because guess what? It's possible. Right. Right? And then okay. we come to the last That's point. The last point. So the last point is about what do you do with the cash flow? See, what we started the whole discussion is two, five, and seven. Mm -hmm. Right? Seven years, we want to pay it off. So what do we do with the cash flow? And this is something I've passionately believed in. And that is this, that I am not going to touch my cash flow for personal use. Right, and this is something key. And I've, this is one thing. If I've done one thing right in my life, mm -hmm. that is this: that since the day I started buying rental properties, I have never, and I mean it to the last nickel, I have never touched one penny. 
Now, people wow. will look at me and they go, well, what if I need it? Well, if you need it, go right ahead. It's your cash. Right? Flow. I mean, I need to buy a jet. I mean, that's my next goal, right? <laughs> and so, but guys, listen. No, you my, want to buy a jet. No, I, yeah, I, I want I to buy, buy a jet. jet. Yeah, I need it, actually, you know. <laughs> I, it's just, I need it. So, it, my point is this. Guys, we all deserve to do fun things. But you don't do it at the cost of your lifestyle and retirement. This is my belief, right? Is that you don't do it as much as I like fun toys, fun car, all the fun things. One thing I never did was for the first actually seven years of when I was investing, and I still in, I buy property till today, right? I never went and expanded my lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? See, there, there was a friend of mine, very wealthy guy. He said something one day in a very funny way, right? He's like, listen, at the end of the year, figure out the stack of checks that you cut for your personal expenses versus for investments. Mm -hmm. If your personal expenses stack is bigger than your business expenses, than your investments, you're what we call is poor to pathetic. This is how we call <laughs> poor it. Poor to pathetic. Right? He's like, the day your stack of checks that are your investments is twice the size of your personal investments, that's the day you can think about buying a toy. Maybe buying a toy. Okay. And then he says, wait another two or three years. Mm -hmm. So that's so what you're saying is you buy your toys with your with your investments. You don't you don't buy the toy and then you don't buy the, the toy, toy first, first, right? First, I mean you it's buy like, the second. Uh, you know, if you come to our office, right, we have all these toys. We have a stack of cash, we have the houses, we have all these toys, right? And the funny part we've always Try to illustrate a point is, guys, everybody wants nice things. Mm -hmm. Like, who doesn't? Right? Who doesn't? But the issue is not that you should sacrifice for the rest of your life. The issue is, if you take care of real estate for the first five years mm -hmm. and do it right, you can have anything you want pretty much within any monochrome of sense. I mean, it's just, and I'm dead serious. Another way of saying it is, if you're willing to pay the price today mm -hmm. to do what other people are unwilling to do, you can have what other people will never have. For the rest of your life mm -hmm. right either way it all means the same thing right right and so what it boils down to what i did was my principle always was that listen any cash flow that comes in i'm gonna just keep it and just look at it right literally and when i used to tell my business partners initially they're like well what do you mean we're gonna look at it i'm like anytime you feel depressed you go to the bank <laughs> or nowadays you can do it online yeah. and you look at how much cash flow yeah. you have they're like but what are we gonna do with it i'm like nothing we're gonna, they're like, like, we're gonna do nothing with it I'm like, the only thing you're allowed to do is first six months of cash flow, you never touch. Never, 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 which is your reserve. Yeah. That's how you build a reserve. And then beyond that, the only thing you're allowed to do with it is that if we agree, then we're going to buy another property. Mm -hmm. We're not buying property with equity that we sucked out of the property. Right. We're buying with income that the property earned for us. Right. See, there's a difference why the rich get richer. Rich always take the investments money and they buy more investments and more investments and more investments mm -hmm. and at some point they say hey listen let me go buy a nice little toy mm -hmm. and then they go buy more investments so the amount of toys they can buy is a thimble compared to what their investments are right right, right. and the whole philosophy of the 257 i mean literally initially my goal was i mean it was the funniest thing i remember that driving down where my office used to be one day and i felt like a kid you know, one day I'm going to have five houses, right? This was like a... That was your big goal. It was, it was like a goal. goal. And I was telling Rahul at the time that I'm a man, can you imagine there are five suburbs here? If we can have one house in each house, in mm -hmm. each suburb, how rich I would be, right? <laughs> this is not even paid off, mind you, right? Mm -hmm. And what I realized was that if there is one thing I did correctly, right, of all the things, we all do stupid things, I did not use the money from cash flows. Right, the two five seven is a forced way of using a little bit of leverage, using your hard work, mm -hmm. and literally building a two, three, four, five, ten million dollar portfolio if you choose to. Because initially we always talk about two five seven. In reality, you know what happens? Nobody stops at five. Mm -hmm. Right? We have hundreds and hundreds of examples. You know a lot of the people. I right? do. I do. That are at ten, twenty. I mean, the funny thing is nowadays at the three day that we do. Right. People are embarrassed to come on stage with five properties in a year. Right. I mean, it's just they're like, oh, my God, we're not going to go on stage no, we because, don't go. because that's just not enough. Yeah. The 
the issue is not whether this is possible. It is 100% possible. The question is twofold. Number one, are you willing to put the time in to find the properties? Number two, will they hit the numbers? And number three, are you willing to have discipline for a little bit of time? That, that's a big thing. And one thing we didn't touch on is paying off the properties. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that's a great big discussion. So, But at, at what point, let's say you're going along for two years, five years, wh wh at what stage do you start to pay off the property? So I'll give you a perfect example, okay. right? I'm going to use Alec as an example, okay. right? So Alec is somebody that comes to events, and his, his example is pretty good because, so what he did was in first five years, sorry, in first year and a half, he had five properties, Okay. right? And I'm going to use a $500 cash flow just for the sake of Easy illustration. Numbers. It makes sense, yeah. right? He had about $500 cash flow. Uh, on his property number one. Mm -hmm. See, if you take the $500 cash flow and only pay off property number one, what happens is if you have a 30 year mortgage, it gets paid off in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. If you take all of that, six months, first six months you put it aside as reserves, right. and then you start paying it off. And I actually forgot to cover one thing, which is a key of how we do things, which is kind of unorthodox again, but that's just how we do things. Mm -hmm. And that is two years, we don't sign any lease less than a year. Okay. Uh, sorry, less than two years. Two years. I apologize. You know, so we only look for tenants that are two-year tenants. Now, somebody listening to this is going to say, this guy is out of his mind because a lot of tenants don't want to sign a two-year lease. Well, mm -hmm. then we don't rent to them. Yes. Well, what if they have 800 credit score? Well, we don't rent to them. Well, what if they're great tenants? We don't rent to them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I tend to be very fanatical in how I do things in my belief system because what I want is low turnover. And right. I'll give you an example of that. Our tenants, 78% of all our tenants, and this is over 6,000 properties. It's not just my properties. This uh -huh. is over entire thing at Chicago Ria, right? 78% renew the lease again after wow. two years. So you have actually have four-year tenants. With actually, no you have about, if you look at the average, four and a half to five-year tenants. Uh, with no rent terms. With which no is, rent Which terms. is huge. Which is your, the genius of line. why this all works, yeah. right? It's low turnover, right? So... What happens is if you take the 500 bucks we're talking about, your cash flow that's left over, and you only dedicate to one property, it'll take 10 years to pay it off. But here's the key. If you take it from two properties and pay that off, guess what happens? The property pays itself off in seven years. Seven years. And then you can take all of that money plus. So now why do we say two, five, and seven? See, one property is a pain if air conditioning breaks. Two property is a bigger pain. Mm -hmm. But five is a business. Mm -hmm. Guys, we're in the business of investing. We're not in this as a joke. This is not a game. Mm -hmm. This is not something we just do, right? And that's why you need a little bit of scale to help you pay off the property. See, here's the beauty of it. If you take cash flow from five properties and you have $2,000, $2,500 net cash flow a month and you start paying off property number one, it takes about two and a half years, mm -hmm. depending on how much debt you put on it, to pay property number one off two and a half to three years flat out, mm -hmm. right? And guess what? How long it takes to pay property number two off? I'm less. How long? Less. You know, it le it's less. It's because about you have more, to you nine. have all the money from house one. Exactly. So this is really, so that's the magic number is five for scale. Right. Five, okay. You need that's, minimum of five. Now, ideally, obviously, you if you want to do, you know, and people will say, well, Andrew, you know, it's all well and good and blah, blah. But, you know, I'm in Bethesda, Maryland, right? I'm yeah. in like in D.C. Now, just mm -hmm. please. I mean, if you're four steps from Pentagon and White House, <laughs> you probably, I mean, just, just use common sense, guys. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you go 40 miles out. I guarantee you, you can find these properties, right? It's not if, it's a guarantee. See, now you say, well, I have to drive 40 miles. Listen, you want to be a real estate multimillionaire and you want to do it in your pajamas without getting out of your you know, comfort zone, good luck. Never going to happen. No, I mean, it's it, people always amaze me, yeah. right? People will go to work for 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. dedicate 40, 50, 60 hours of their, you know, for somebody else, mm -hmm. yet for themselves, they're not willing to work. It, it's, it's always interesting to me when people give me an excuse because literally come to our market and for every excuse you have, I will show you somebody that w has overcome that excuse. So what my big takeaway from this is, you know, people, they look at somebody that has 50 houses or 100 houses, they, they simply that's, can't wrap their brain around it. But they that's not what they should be looking at. They, but if you think about five houses, if I have five houses, 
this is what I can do. And as you start to pay them off, you go, wait, well, wait a minute. I need maybe get five more. And I know we talked a little bit about 14 being another magic number. Did you want to talk so about that just a bit? You're talking about like the LPN uh, for people, right? Yeah. Okay. So what we found out is this. Think about this, right? In most areas, if you take, let's just say it costs you. Now, the cost of living, obviously, in Chicago is going to be high, mm -hmm. right? But if you take most of the country, let's say you have about your expenses are, say, $5,000 a month. You take the 5000 number, right, and you divide it by 400 bucks. And I'll explain what 400 is. You divide it by 400 So what should you get? About 12 right? Ballpark, about 12 And I would take that 12 number, ideally, and I would multiply that by 1.2, or 20% higher, which will put you at about 14 See, the yeah, 14 Explain to them what LPN is. So LPN means lifestyle property number. number. What that means is this, that... To have the lifestyle that you want, what is the minimum amount of properties you have to own, right? The minimum number here, 5,000 divided by 400, and 400 is your net cash flow, so I'm being a little conservative, right? Um, it gives you 12. Then why do we multiply it up? Guys, listen, anytime you plan something in life, guess what happens? Life never cooperates, right? Something is going to go wrong somewhere, so let's just plan on it. Let's plan on one tenant leaving. Let's plan on maybe having some vacancy. We always built our margins within the plan. Right. So if I need 12, guess what I'm gonna do? Gonna I'm gonna have 14, 14, right? And guys, 400 bucks we're talking about without paying the properties off. Mm -hmm. Guess what? If you actually pay the properties off with the formula we're suggesting, that means you need only seven properties that are paid off. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, if you actually put some time and thought into this, seven properties you can pay off in less than 10 years, flat out, right? And the question is not whether it works. The question is, how hard are you willing to work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's really what this boils down to. The problem with this whole thing is, it's too simplistic, mm -hmm. well, that's, right? That's and a, that is where the problem is. That's the beauty of it, though, because people have a problem with big pictures. But if you give them a path, uh, a success path, and you to get over here, you start over here, and these are the steps, I think people can follow that. Yeah. But, it, you know, a lot of times, most people, what they want to do is make it complicated. I want to do big stuff. I want to buy apartment buildings. That's exciting. Right? They don't want to stick to the basic, simple core things. Mm -hmm. So, well, we covered a lot compared to what we thought we, we were going we to talk about. We covered a lot. I just kept, I apologize. I just kept thinking of things that I thought were important. So, um Thanks so much definitely. for doing the show. And I'm going to put Andrew's contact information below the show and definitely reach out to him or a member of his team. And uh, he has a lot of great stuff. So uh, this is Sharon Bornholt, and I'll see you next week. Same time, same place.